Thank you to everyone online for joining us today live for Investing in Psychedelics, Building Value Through IP. Presented by the CSE, CFN Media, and Zuber Lawler, we are pleased to have four guests today and one guest moderator. Graham McFarlane, CCO, Albert Labs. James Coe, CEO, Trip Therapeutics, also probably listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. That's the only plug I will do. Greg Peterson, CEO, Bexham Biomedical, and Dr. Mitra from Zuber Lawler. They will be our four panelists. And of course, our guest moderator is none other, none other than Managing Director Tom Zuber, of course, from Zuber Lawler. We're going to keep this, a I'll keep this intro a little bit brief, uh, simply because we are, <laughs> we're on a schedule. We have three, uh, three different panels, three different sessions today starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The first one is going to be moderated and hosted by Tom, Zu uh, Tom Zuber. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome all our panelists to come to the stage. And I will turn it over. I encourage our audience to please submit questions. Make sure you direct who these questions are for. And uh, Tom... I will, uh, I'll let you know what comes up in the Q and A box. So over to you. Thank you so much, Barrington. And thank you uh, to our friends at the CSC and also at CFN Media. Uh, we're pleased to be uh, to be participating in this Psychedelics Virtual Conference. I'm Tom Zuber, I'm the managing partner of Zuber Lawler. Very briefly, Zuber Lawler has six offices across the United States, and we've been representing leading companies in plant medicines for over 14 years, uh, which is, uh, well, somewhat of an eternity uh, in the plant medicine space. Uh, so uh, we've done it all uh, from a, a deal standpoint, a, a litigation standpoint, an IP standpoint, an FDA standpoint, and a, a full-on regulatory standpoint. I'm here with an outstanding panel, and I would like to start um, by beginning uh, uh, I'd like to begin by giving each panelist a chance to tell us a bit about their own backgrounds and about their companies and what got them excited, uh, their companies excited in the area of psychedelics. Um, so we'll keep this brief because we'd like to get into the heart of this panel. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited uh, to see the answers to these questions myself. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and start? I'm going left to right on my view screen here. Graham McFarlane uh, over at Albert Labs. Can you tell us a bit about your own background? Uh, and also about uh, well about Albert Labs and, and what Albert Labs is focused on. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Graham McFarlane. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Albert Labs. My background, interestingly, is actually the pharmaceutical industry. So this is a bit of a crossover for me. Uh, I've worked in that industry for some time. Um, a bit about Albert Labs. Albert Labs is a laboratory-based clinical research and drug development enterprise. We're very much with the scientific behaviors of a biotech company. We're focused on improving patient access to psychedelic assisted therapies through our accelerated regulatory approval pathways and early access schemes that are appearing everywhere. The company's focus is very much on uh, cancer-related mental health, that being anxiety and depression. And we are focusing initially in the UK where both cancer and mental health are actually national agenda items. And there is, um, growing experience and happiness uh, in the uh, form of uh, unmet need with an excess of percent of patients uh, who have anxiety and depression uh, either undertreated or experiencing uh, severe side effects which obviously affects compliance. We live, Albert Laps lives to bring remedies, uh, solutions to the marketplace to allow patients to be treated effectively and to allow them to lead a more than normal life given the current situation. Uh, we will talk a bit more in the uh, Q&A or in the questions that Tom has for me directly about just how we're going around that. But that's a bit about Albert Labs. Great, thank you, Graham. Uh, and next on my view screen here, uh, James Quo, the CEO of Trip Therapeutics. Uh, James, can you tell us a bit about your own background uh, and also uh, about Trip and what you're focused on? Sure. Uh, let me say it's also a pleasure to be here and on behalf of the entire TRIP team, I want to thank the conference sponsors, in particular uh, CSE, uh, for their uh, support and the opportunity. You know, speaking to investors is a critical part of our mission, informing them about what we're doing, why we're doing it. And CSE has been, been incredible. 
the process of our going public and becoming publicly traded has not gone any smoother. So my background is I'm a uh, physician. I started out at University of Pennsylvania. I also happened to pick up an MBA from the Wharton School of Business while I was there. And I've been doing biopharma drug development for the last uh, 20 plus years. I spent some time at Pfizer doing licensing development for them. But just moving on to what TRIP is, and TRIP is a company that's focused on developing psychedelic drugs for two areas of medicine where the need is, is huge. One is eating disorders. The other one is chronic pain. These are two therapeutic areas that are really uh, looking for some sort of breakthrough therapy, and we're going to be doing clinical testing of our drug candidates for that. So thank, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, next, we have Greg Peterson, CEO over at Bexon Biomedical. Greg, can you tell us a bit about your own background and also about Bexon's focus? Yes. Uh, thank you, Tom, so much uh, for having me. Um, uh, Greg Peterson, CEO of Bexon Biomedical. And my background is uh, been in healthcare R&D for over 20 years, developing both uh, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, biologics, and combination products uh, for a wide variety of therapeutic areas. Uh, co-founded Bexon Biomedical about three years ago. Bexon is um, focused, our lead indication, we're developing a non-opioid ketamine-based therapy for both chronic and acute pain types. And what we're doing is we're going to be delivering that therapy subcutaneously with a wearable infusion device. Uh, and actually what we've come to find is that this subcutaneous delivery technology is ideal for delivering controlled release of controlled substances. So we actually believe that uh, that device technology has a lot of ways that could be applied to other drugs um, in the psychedelic medicine space, but outside of it, but in particular for controlled substances. Uh, and so we're also evaluating other uh, therapeutic options uh, with our technology. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, and also, um, I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague, Dr. Jayashri Mitra, my law partner at Zuber Lawler. Um, is having a technical issue, so hopefully she'll join us soon. Um, but Dr. Mitra's background extends, uh, uh, well, back decades when you include her time as a, as a scientist before she became an attorney. Uh, uh, Dr. Mitra has a PhD in pharmacology from Yale um, and, and does a, a great deal of work in relation to the pharma industry, the cannabis industry, and now the psychedelics industry. So I'm looking forward to seeing my colleague, Dr. Mitra, as well. Um, why don't we go ahead and jump into the uh, the questions here. Uh, first of all, this is such an exciting topic and such an exciting time in the area of psychedelics. Uh, it's also new and, and how often, certainly as an attorney, but I think also as scientists, how often you get to work on something this new uh, that, that takes the world's imagination uh, as quickly as psychedelics has. Uh, so on that note here, obviously uh, for me as an IP attorney, uh, it's always about IP uh, and the focus of this conference is IP. But of course the psychedelics industry today is substantially focused on IP. Uh, in, in most uh, jurisdictions, uh, uh, prominent marketplaces around the world, uh, psilocybin and other psychedelics are still uh, quite illegal uh, in many or most or, or even all respects. Um, so it, uh, these days, it's a process of anticipating the future and developing technologies um, that will be exploited tomorrow. Um, so we have a, a wonderful panel to, to dig into things here. And I'd like to start with uh, James, uh, uh, Dr. Quo over at Trip Therapeutics. Um, doctor, what, what inspired TRIP, what inspired you uh, to apply psilocybin to eating disorders and to fibromyalgia in particular, um, of all the physiological conditions that are out there? And, and what have you seen about psilocybin that, uh, that makes it suitable to treat these uh, physiological conditions? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm glad to answer that question for you. So let me say that I think psychedelics is going to be possibly one of the dominant news stories uh, later on this year. And there's many data points that suggest that's the, going to be the case. Uh, you know, we have the esketamine results that Janssen uh, got approval for, also the, the clinical trial results for, for psilocybin uh, in intractable depression. And this has really gotten the world's attention for three reasons. First is that uh, the uh, treatment duration has been really quite phenomenal. So a single dose, I'm talking about in case of depression, uh, the the effect has been from weeks to months. Uh, it's worked in the majority of patients, also worked in uh, patients who are treatment resistant. So they failed all of the therapies. Now, the question you asked, Tom, is can this be applied to other areas? We're firmly of the belief that absolutely the case. There obviously needs to be scientific slash clinical trial research. Uh, we're very data-driven in that respect. We're planning to do 
uh, multiple pilot clinical trials to establish, answer the questions, what is the therapeutic dose? What type of psychedelic counseling is required? What is the duration? Uh, how much does it need to be repeated, if at all? And we're applying it, as I mentioned in the intro, to two areas that have a, a tremendous need. The first is eating disorders. Our focus there is on overeating, and in particular on ultra-orphan diseases. We haven't disclosed the exact one. We will, uh, in time, uh, in, inform investors about what we're doing. But we believe that that is one that uh, psilocybin in particular will be tremendously effective as well as also chronic uh, pain. Uh, these are very complex um, negative behaviors that um, should be really little different from intractable uh, depression in terms of having a therapeutic effect. And we have a lot of data that suggests that it should be efficacious. Uh, thank you, doctor. Appreciate that. Uh, and, and let's go next uh, to Greg. Greg, uh, ketamine is a word that we hear a lot today, uh, and, and folks know that vaguely that it is a psychedelic, but I, I don't think that there's a, a, a full understanding and, and, and noting that there's a wide spectrum of, of folks viewing here. Some are, are established scientists in the field, but many are investors sort of taking a peek at psychedelics. Um, for, for the sake of, of the, the, the latter category of, of, of viewers, um, can you tell us a bit about ketamine's potential as a powerful alternative uh, non-opioid uh, over-the-counter pain reliever? Yeah, uh, no, thanks, Tom, for the question. And, you know, ketamine has been around for decades. It's a hot drug in the mental health space. In some ways, it kind of gave psychedelic medicine a bit of, of, of validation when Johnson & Johnson got Spravato approved. Uh, we at Bexson said that's all well and good, and we may come back to mental health indications with our ketamine therapy. Um, but there is also decades of data showing it can be safe and effective in treating pain both chronic and acute pain types. And we shifted over there because there's a very compelling market. There again is existing data to help guide us in our, uh, in our research. And there's just an enormous commercial market, an enormous potential to alleviate human suffering. Um, before COVID, uh, the opioid crisis was kind of the epidemic du jour and um, they're both you know terrible situations. We are very much focused on trying to move the needle on opioid addiction rates by providing non-opioid therapy that patients can go home with. Now, we're, our value proposition, is a value proposition is that at-home use of low-dose ketamine could be a game changer for chronic and acute pain types. And so we want to make it available for home use. We need to get the FDA's buy-in on that, of course. Um, it certainly would still be by prescription, uh, but that's where we're trying to make this therapy accessible and the niche that we're going after. That said, a wide variety of indications that ketamine is currently used for off-label that we could we could spend the day talking about all those different options. That's wonderful. And, and I'll note here that it, it's, uh, I don't know if the word is ironic, it's certainly interesting that ketamine and, 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 and psychedelics in general have been here in front of us for such a long period of time and we're just now starting to study uh, the, the powerful potential that it has to alleviate physiological conditions, including uh, uh, providing pain relief. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing, Greg. Uh, Graham, uh, your, your Albert Labs focuses now has chosen to focus on depression, anxiety, existential crisis. Um, why, why, that, why that focus for Albert Labs and for you? Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, let's talk about the UK in the first instance, then we'll move on to Europe. But in the UK, cancer and mental health are both national agenda items. They get the attraction and attention of our Department of Health, but also the governments, and indeed it's become a priority overall. Um, Current treatments, this is already touched on for depression with SSRIs, have been around for 25 plus years. They fail in over 50% of sufferers and particularly in um, hard to treat depressions. And the side effect profile, unfortunately, sometimes leads to poor medic medication compliance. So this represents an unmet need. So the reason for being there is there are a huge number of patients. In the UK alone, it's something like 1.2 million patients who actually suffer from um, anxiety, depression, of which half are not receiving uh, effective treatments. That's why we exist. This is why Albert Labs was formed. This is why we're doing the research we're doing. And we want to bring this, our form of psilocybin, to market as quickly as possible to try and meet this unmet need. Um, uh, I think it was Greg that touched, touched on it earlier. There's been some work done in this area that whilst it's interesting and it's making us want to look at it more closely, uh, the trials have been very uh, low-key, they haven't been powered up enough, so we will be going down 
a, a real world evidence route, which I'll, I'll come on to uh, quite soon. Very good. Um, so let, let's go there, actually. Let's talk about uh, uh, evidence uh, of efficacy, um, uh, evidence of safety, uh, clinical trials. Uh, let, let's, let's look around there for a while. And why don't we stay with you, Graham, on that? Uh, real world evidence, you're, you're heading down that route. Can you tell us a, a bit about why that model? And, and also, can you explain for our audience, what is the real world evidence route? <laughs> yeah, and he's explained every time. To, 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 yeah. To, yeah, it's... it's um, Real, real world evidence has started to come into its own in the last decade. And certainly in the last two to three years has become a very uh, important part of uh, decisions that have been made, whether to license products yeah. in the UK and Europe, and I'm sure with some of the early access schemes in the US and North America's uh, there also. But real world evidence takes us away the RCT option, the randomized clinical trial route, where um, you're actually dealing with random groups of patients in uh, two forms. That's, that's treat, treated patients and patients on a, either a, a, a marker product or a placebo, uh, where you're randomly switching over patient types. In the real world setting, you're actually dealing with the real world decision making process. You're toe to toe with patients and clinicians who are actually doing this on a day to day basis. The data that we actually extract from this is invaluable. And it is a major part of our IP, the, the data. The data will tell us that uh, in these groups of patients that we're, we're, we're targeting, that's the cancer-related anxiety depression patients, how well our product's working. It'll tell us very quickly how well it works, which cohort of patients that it's actually working well in. And we'll be able to use that data for further work that we're planning for later this year and into next year. So this allows us from an IP perspective to have I guess, you know, blue ocean between what's been happening out there already and allow us to actually make decisions with clinicians on behalf of patients to get this in front of them quickly. Um, how we, much is out there? Oh, pardon me, Graham. I, I was going to ask, how much is out there already in terms of the, the foundation that, that you're working uh, on top of? What what is, is it just empty labs here? There's just uh, empty databases, no, 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 uh, no evidence at all, given obviously the the transient uh, uh, state of things from a legal perspective. But uh, what what's what are you working with? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So what we've we, what we've uh, decided to do strategically is we're actually working with key academic and research centres, and they already have all the processes in place to conduct the real world evidence studies. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a parallel sister company of ours in the medicinal cancer field. We're looking at uh, cancer related pain, so we're sitting with the same group. Uh, and in that area, the real world evidence study is already kicking off and it's been signed off. It's getting MHRA clearance for registration. So all these things, including NICE, just recently announcing that real world evidence will be accepted as a submittable clinical evidence in support of registration and commissioning by both the MHRA and uh, NICE. 61% of NICE guidance was supported by real world evidence, a further 30% with positive guidance and restrictions. So it's powerful, it's data-driven, it strengthens our IP and our brand strength, and it puts Albert in a great position to actually get this in front of patients as quickly as possible. And that's what we seek to do. Uh, and clearly beyond that, you know, as prescriptions are picked up, revenues generated. So, it, you know, it takes all the boxes. Yeah, Tom, it's kind of an interesting space because you do have, in some cases, thousands of years of human experience with yeah. some of these compounds that does not mean data that the fda or ema would use to approve those and so we're sort of doing it in an odd course in in with uh, many of these existing drugs now we have to go and as as grant points out run the r rigorous clinical trials to support both safety and efficacy so they can be approved um and then you know inherent in that is well do you have enough ip uh drugs that have been around for decades or longer uh, can be very difficult to provide a good patent moat around. I know all of our companies are doing that uh, in different ways, uh, but that actually is one of the interesting areas of this space is how different people are writing IP and how defensible will that IP, uh, you know, remain, you know, remain over over time. That's a very interesting question. I, w I want to get to a few of the things that you had talked about, uh, and, and and certainly IP and where that's going in this space is is, is one of them. Um, but first, st staying on clinical trials, how far along are you, uh, uh, James? Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Greg, how far along are you uh, in, in terms of clinical trials? 
We are not in the clinic yet with our lead therapy, BB, BB106. We are still in non-clinical studies, um, yeah. but we will be using those animal studies to support our R&D submission. Uh, we're targeting that for uh, the second half of 2021 and then hopefully promptly into the clinic uh, at that time. Great. Um, and, and James, where, where, uh, uh, where are you? Where is TRIP uh, in terms of clinical trials uh, development? Yeah, great question. Uh, TRIP expects to be in the clinic uh, later this year. We expect to be working with uh, academic institutions, uh, both in the U.S., possibly overseas as well. And in regards to your question about um, what we're trying to accomplish, there's really three objectives. The first, as you mentioned, is safety. That always has to be foremost. Uh, make sure that uh, psilocybin is uh, safe to administer to patients. The second really is uh, proof of concept. Does it work? And you asked this question earlier. Does it work in eating disorders, particularly the ones we're targeting, as well as fibromyalgia? But the part that really touches upon IP is optimizing the therapy, assuming, uh, obviously, it, it works. And that's where we think we can build um, a lot of IP. It'll be multiple uh, patents that are filed. And we expect, because uh, it's never been optimized before, that those patents will issue. And certainly other people could uh, try the same therapy that's not optimized. I, I don't know why they would want to do that um, once, once we would get approval for it. So that's our IP strategy. Very good. And, and I want to hear more about that uh, as well, James. Um, what are your plans for human trials? And, and, and what I mean is I, I understand that you're currently in talks with the university. And, and what's the reason why um, you chose that particular university uh, to perhaps collaborate with uh, in relation to human trials? If you could give us some insight on that, because that's that's also new. And thinking about clinical trials, particularly human clinical trials in relation to psychedelics. Well, that's a trip. Uh, actually, I did not intend that pun. <laughs> Yeah, we, we are 100% data driven. Uh, we are follow scientific uh, protocols. Uh, we work with academic institutions. We work in many cases with the number one uh, key opinion leader for our therapeutic areas uh, defined by who has the most publications. And our plan is really to do uh, pilot clinical studies. Uh, we actually, as a team, think about all the questions out there that need to be answered with clinical testing. Uh, as I mentioned before, things like what is the uh, therapeutic dose? What is the treatment duration? What type of psychedelic counseling might they need? You know, there's questions sometimes people think microdosing might be effective. We personally don't think so, but we want to answer those questions. And the way we do that is by doing multiple pilot clinical trials, and that will inform us, and we can then do a more thorough, larger uh, clinical proof of concept study, probably with the academic institution. Very exciting. Um, Greg, I want to talk about wearable delivery devices, and you you poked at this a little bit, but I, I'd like to explore it more. Um, first, tell us about Bexton's wearable uh, delivery devices, and and what what solutions are you looking to provide that sort of aren't out there already in relation to relevant subject matter? Yeah. So what we're developing, again, is a wearable infusion device, very, very similar to what's currently approved to deliver insulin to diabetes patients. Um, so in some ways, we're not trying to be that innovative. We're trying to leverage what's already there. Um, that said, what we're doing and how we're customizing it is to make this a closed system. Uh, that is, you're reducing patient access. You're re making it tamper resistant. Um, and you don't have the ability for a patient to go and access these therapies that are controlled substances and use them in some way other than how they're intended, um, either by misuse or abuse. We believe that's going to be key to the FDA and other regulatory agencies getting comfort with these therapies being used, uh, maybe in the clinic, but definitely if these therapies are gonna be used in the home setting. So that's our that's where we set out. What we now found is again, we've got, we believe uh, some of the best technology, if you wanna deliver a controlled substance in a controlled fashion, uh, this is perhaps the best way to do it. But on top of that, you're now avoiding first pass metabolism. You're avoiding the GI tract. There's a lot of unwanted side effects that can come with some of these medications when they are taken orally. Um, not all, but certainly some. And so you're solving some of the unwanted side effects. You also have the ability to adjust the dose profile to be more applicable for a certain indication. You can have a drug that when taken orally may take hours to come on and have effect. You can have it come on a lot faster potentially. 
And, you know, some of these therapies um, may have an experience the patients are going to have um, joined by a clinician, by a healthcare provider. They can last six, eight hours, a very long period of time. How does that really work in the Western healthcare model? How does that reimburse? How does that work for a doctor's office? It's, it's, it's difficult. Well, what if you could get the same therapeutic benefit in a two-hour experience or some shorter, and you could bring that on more rapidly and you could take it off more rapidly? That is the effect. Um, this is some of the things we're able to control, not 100%, but you're able to control when you do have the ability to use a wearable infusion device that it's similar to delivering it um, intravenously, but you don't have that medicalized procedure. You don't have a pole and a needle in your arm. Um, so lower expense and a lower, um, lower medicalization of the experience and of the procedure. Uh, that was very helpful. And, and there's a lot to unpack there. And, and I'd like to get to that, Greg. Uh, Dr. Mitra, uh, Jay, your timing literally was precision perfect um, because we are just about to launch into the IP conversation. And I think uh, I'm certainly biased. Um, Dr. Dr. Mitra is my colleague, but uh, she is one of the brilliant minds in, in psychedelics IP. And it's, it's an honor to have her on the panel with us. Um, so um, Jay, uh, before we do that, I, I do want to get one uh, question out of the way here before we move into uh, the, the IP, the patents. Uh, and I think uh, in, in many respects, the fun stuff. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about the importance of doing uh, due diligence to determine FTO challenges, uh, uh, thinking of international IP and regulatory st strategies, supply chains, all of those things. Can you, can you uh, speak a bit on that before we turn the, the, the conversation heavily over toward IP? Um, absolutely. Uh, so to give a bit about my own background, um, I used to be a research scientist uh, for a while before um, you know, killing rats did not seem that exciting. I mean, it's thrilling, but, you know, at a time you think there must be better things to do in life. And I became a lawyer and I've worked in pharmaceutical. It's given me a perspective on what to think about when we are engaging in billions of dollars worth of drug developments and what are the pitfalls. So let's talk about due diligence. One of the things we don't want to engage in when we are doing drug, drug development is spend, you know, a few hundred million dollars and then discover that someone else has patents or pa pending patent applications. That's going to keep us from taking a product to market without having to pay through our nose. So before we engage in, uh, in, you know, we have a brilliant idea, we're going to move forward. Let's look at the landscape. What are the pitfalls? And this is an ongoing exercise because, you know, there is a lag time before uh, an application is published for our product. Does someone else have competing IP that we need to consider? What, what is the landscape that we need to be concerned about? Do we need to license something? Do we need to in-license something? Do we have something we can trade to get the IP we need? So that's the due diligence I'm talking about. And then if we want to buy the company, we'll have the savings. So that's something we have to consider when we're embarking on this journey. Then we are, when we are talking about developing a product, obviously a single country is not our target. We want to have worldwide exposure. So when we are building our IP portfolio, we have to think about which countries do we want to go to, what is going to be our international IP uh, strategy, and how does that line up with our IP with our regulatory strategy, because uh, every country where we are going to seek regulatory approval, we do want a corresponding IP portfolio. And we also have to remember the expiration date of the patents in each country is not going to be the same. So we may have different durations of IP protections in each country. And how does that play into um, our commercial value of our portfolio? So when we are thinking about how we are going to build out our company, how we are going to build out the value of our drug, how we are going to build out our regulatory strategy, we are also building out our IP strategy around uh, those parameters. So um, I think that's like a very top line view of the considerations uh, we have to keep in mind as we are moving forward with drug development. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. Yes, and, and that notion of, well, it's, it's a patchwork job uh, when you're doing international portfolio uh, building and management. So, uh, uh, so great to hear that insight. Uh, let me start with a, a general question uh, for the whole panel. 
Um, what, which of your patents, patent applications are you more excited, most excited about and to the extent that you can talk about these things, uh, to the extent that it, it's public, uh, we, we'd love to hear why you're excited. So uh, that's open question for the panel. Uh, what patent, patent applications are you most excited about and, and tell, us, tell us what you can about why you're excited. I'll take the first crack at it. Um, we have, uh, we're developing an, an IP portfolio around uh, formulation technology that we're using so that it's a better way to deliver, uh, in, in the first case, our ketamine therapy, right? Mm -hmm. We want something that's not obvious, provides new utility and is novel. Um, if we're briefly gonna check those boxes. And I think we're excited about it uh, because we now see that there's a way to take that technology and apply it to a wide variety of other compounds, uh, of other families of compounds for a variety of improvements, whether it's a better PK profile, better bioavailability, um, greater comfort for the patient. Um, that's where we're focusing and, and we'll say we're excited about it because we think we can extend that into some other, uh, to other uh, classes of compounds. Wonderful. Yeah, Tom, maybe I'll chime in here. So our our philosophy is to file lots of patents so that there's not one specific patent that's our favorite. But anytime I think you just discuss IP, it has to be in the context of what a company's business strategy is. And ours, very simply stated, is to license or transact the drug after phase two proof of concept studies. So it is not our intention to go phase three, uh, get FDA approval. And so a lot of members of our team have been on the other side of the table at Large Pharma doing these type of transactions, including myself, and we know what it takes. Uh, basically, the um, patent portfolio has to pass due diligence by uh, the Large Pharma uh, company, their counsel. And so we've been uh, expecting this from really from day one and been very, um, very thorough in terms of uh, patenting, we, we do what most people, I think, do, which is start with provisional patents and then file the regular uh, patents within a, a year. But we're planning to do that very, very broadly. And as I mentioned before, on ways to optimize therapy. Very good. Let me uh, ask a, a, another general question, if I can. And this is, this is an open question for the group. Uh, given that the psychedelic subject matter is so new um, in this in this context, this open public context, if you will, uh, there seems to be a conflation, if you will, uh, about uh, using psychedelics, leveraging the, the potential of psychedelics to treat psychological conditions uh, and, and as opposed to the physiological conditions that may underlie those psychological conditions. And that conflation, that pouring of the line, I'd like to explore that a little bit. Um, so as an example, and, and this is a question open for the group, but to, to focus for a minute, just to illustrate the point um, on Dr. Quo on 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 your uh, 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 on trips focus um, on fibromyalgia, uh, and uh, I understand that there's certainly a, a powerful psychedelic component to the work that you're doing. Are you looking more at the psycho psychological effects and treating the psychological effects of that underlying condition, or are you actually attacking those those those, those physical mechanisms themselves that that uh, that, that under a lot of psychological conditions or both? And, and again, that, that's to illustrate the point, but that's an open question for the group. How much are you working to treat uh, the, the underlying physiological conditions as opposed to the psychological conditions, uh, given that we typically associate psychedelics with, with, with uh, psychological effects? Yeah, Tom, so to answer your question, we believe we'll be treating the underlying root cause of fibromyalgia. So our PFN, that stands for psilocybin for Neuropsychiatric Disorder Program, Mm -hmm. We target uh, diseases where the cause as well as the symptoms are in the brain. So in the case of fibromyalgia, there is no known physiological cause. It's not caused by low blood sugar, high blood sugar, or anything like that. No one really knows. What is known or thought is that it's a disorder of the processing of, of pain signals, and it's chronic. It's throughout the body. We think uh, psilocybin is absolutely perfect for treating both the symptoms as well as the cause because the whole problem really originates in the brain. It's nowhere else in the uh, body other than the brain. That's what the key opinion leaders believe. Very good. Um, so uh, let's talk a bit about patent litigation and, and what's coming down the line. And, and I, I got my own start a couple decades ago 
um, at uh, a law firm White and Case's New York City office. And, and the, the day I started, uh, I had some boxes put on my desk and they related to the transgenic corn industry. Um, and, and I do remember that the patents had just issued. And, and now, uh, uh, if you were in the transgenic corn industry, a major part of your life was, was patent litigation, uh, whether you were a lawyer or not. Um, and then, of course, we're, we're familiar with pharma. Um, and, and that's uh, given rise to a, a, a sub-industry, if you will, that's, that's called pharma patent litigation. Uh, and it seems that uh, the cannabis industry is starting to enter that cannabis war phase, and certainly Zuber Lawler is involved in that, and my own colleague, Dr. Mitra. Um, uh, so it, it does seem obvious that psychedelics is, in some general sense, going to head in that same direction. It's going to be a lot, uh, significantly about IP and then uh, ostensibly about the litigation that flows from ownership of IP and people uh, but potentially infringing uh, uh, ownership rights. So uh, what, what do folks think here on the panel, this is an open question again, about the future of patent litigation in the psychedelic space and how will the development of patent litigation in, in the psychedelic space drive the development, uh, technological and otherwise, of the industry itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'm not going to put the question back to you, but I'm going to say there's three things that I think we don't know that will be very interesting in the coming years uh, mm -hmm. in this space. Uh, the first one is there's some friction between taking drugs that, again, may have been developed by an indigenous population a thousand years ago, and now current day we're trying to patent those. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a reality of delivering healthcare in, again, Western societies. Um, but there's some appropriate friction there. Um, and I think that's a topic that's being discussed. Uh, number two, how defensible will these patents be if for a given company, for a given idea, if something gets FDA approval, I feel very confidently that that patent will get challenged, whether it's by generic makers or otherwise. Uh, and we'll have to see how good companies like ours do at patenting drugs that may be decades old um, or our unique uses for them. Um, and, you know, the other one is, OK, great, you've got a patent on a given drug. There's eight other companies that have a patent, a different patent, maybe it's a manufacturing, who knows what, on that same compound or a similar derivative of it. How will these companies differentiate themselves? Um, these are questions that, that Bexton's chewing on and trying to be very deliberate about. But I think those are it'll be very interesting to see how different companies do navigate this space over the uh, you know, coming years. Can, can I make a comment to that as well, Tom, for me? Um, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the patent debate is, is, is real, it's new, it's coming our way. Uh, I'm, I'm in the UK, uh, which is not a highly litigious market, uh, but there are certain things we have to do from a process point of view to protect our products anyway. We have to conduct ourselves, our behaviours in a certain manner, with or without patent. Now, the behaviours are just as important as owning a patent against certain uh, processes uh, and for us the real world evidence clinical stuff that supports what we are doing I think we stand up to any scrutiny uh, as it happens because there's rigor put behind it right at the start but it's also about the company behaviors I talked about way back at the start behaving like a biotech company and that's what we must do you know as, as, as people entering the psychedelic field um, it's still very new to all of us but we have got behavior sets that are learned we know what to bring to market we know how to behave we know how to do things and, you know, reaching out for this panacea of um, my patent's better than your patent. Um, everybody's going to argue, everybody's going to have that debate. But what I would ask is that we guard against um, uh, claiming things like class effect, which happens a lot in the pharmaceutical industry, when in fact there's nothing supporting it clinically. Class effect is an easy way to nick somebody's market share. We're all out there trying to grow the psychedelic market. We can do an awful lot to make sure that we're doing the right things early and we can actually deliver well to that then later. And at the end of that, all of this, litigation or no, are patients. We're here to try and bring remedies to patients, so I, I certainly am. And we want to keep behaving in that manner. So, you know, all the way through this whole process, it's about how you behave as a corporation as well. Indeed. All right, sorry, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We have a two minute warning. Um, and if our moderator can just take a look at some of the questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, two minute warning, I will appear with 30 seconds left. Uh, okay. Actually, Barrington, if you could, um, I, I'm not seeing the questions here in Barrington. Uh, you're such a charismatic presence and, and a dear friend. Why don't you go ahead and, uh, and take the questions for me, sir? Uh, yeah, there are, uh, let's see. Sorry, this might've been mentioned. Who actually produced the ketamine MDMA psilocybin used for these studies and special access program in Canada. Thanks. 
Uh, that was from Anthony. Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I could answer from what the, what we're doing. And we put out a press release that we're making synthetic psilocybin from a, uh, a manufacturer in the U.S. called uh, AMRI. So that's what we're up to. We uh, are also I, oh, sorry, sourcing API, in our case, API ketamine, making our proprietary formulation under GMP conditions with Thermo Fisher. So using, a, a again, GMP uh, manufacturer. And this one's directed to Greg. What are some of these clinical animal studies? Yeah, and then clinical studies usually reserved for humans, animal studies being sort of non-clinical the way we think about them. Uh, we are going to be running uh, traditional um, toxicity studies in our animal program to prepare and justify going into humans. Um, so I won't go and list them all out here, but a normal suite of IND enabling uh, animal studies is what we're going to be running. And I'm going to, this is the final minute. Uh, Barney had a question directed for Albert Labs. I will ask if Barney can uh, either send it to me, barrington.miller at the CSE.com, and I'll relay it. I just want to give our presenters and our moderator a, a final say before we wrap up. Great. Um, well, um, there's so much to talk about here, and I'd love to continue talking for another hour. Uh, I really would, and I, I've got the questions to prove it. Uh, so unfortunately, we'll have to continue this conversation, uh, perhaps even someday, uh, COVID willing in person, um, under God. Um, but I do want to take the time to thank this panel. Uh, just a, a wonderful lineup here and, and so much to talk about in second, it's such a, an exciting time for the psychedelics industry emerging as it is. So thank you, uh, Graham McFarlane, uh, Chief Commercial Officer over at Albert Labs, uh, Dr. James Quo, CEO at Trip Therapeutics, Greg Peterson, CEO at Bexton Biomedical, and my own colleague, Dr. Jayashri Mitra, uh, New York partner at Zuber Lawler. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation and, and a lot of education. Thank Thanks you. so much. Enjoy it. Thank course, you. Thank you to our uh, wonderful moderator and for Bye. Frank Lane and CFN Media. Without uh, you know value partners, none of this would be possible. I would direct our audience to check out the chat, and you will find the link for the second panel. Um, and I've been your host, this person behind the scenes, uh, Barrington Miller with the Canadian Securities Exchange. Thank you all. And uh, if you have any questions, again. Barrington.mayor at the CSE.com. Thank you.